everybody and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video, again, I'm looking at UK politics and today I'm going to look at referendums. So what do you need to know? Well, according to the A-level specification, what you need to know is referendums and how they are used, how referendums have been used in the UK and their impact on UK political life since 1997, the case for and the case against referendums in a representative democracy which sounds like it might be quite a nice area for a potential 30 mark essay. So this is a really important um, topic and referendums obviously have been big news in UK politics in recent years. Um, there, there was a, I don't know whether you've heard this, there was a referendum about whether we should leave the EU in 2016. It, it was in the news um, and we're going to talk about that and other ones. So what is a referendum? It is a popular vote on a single issue. It, it's a form of direct democracy. It's commonly used in, in Switzerland. In, in the, uh, the last week, uh, there's been a, uh, a referendum in Switzerland about whether they uh, should continue with the free movement of, of um, people with, with the EU and they voted in favour. And, and you, you get it all the time in Switzerland. In Switzerland, it's not seen as that huge a deal. It's, it's, it's commonplace. In the UK, increasingly, the convention appears to be that, that they, you, the, there's a use of referendums on any con, constitu, constitutional issue. So if it's a major change to the way that the UK is governed, then we have a referendum about it. And that convention really has, seems to have come in since 1997. In the UK, we must remember that Parliament is sovereign and <coughs> referendums aren't actually binding. Um, they, you maybe wouldn't get that impression from the press, but UK, uh, UK is a representative democracy. Parliament holds all the power. So theoretically, we could have a referendum. The referendum could say we should do X and Parliament should go, yeah, we should do Y. And that would that would happen. Obviously, the uh, the um, outcome of that would be mass public outcry and lots of demonstrations. And therefore, it is unlikely. Now, referendums aren't always used consistently. And again, we come to uh, an issue with that in the UK. So there isn't a statutory kind of measure in terms of within our constitution about how we should use referendums, unlike in, in other countries where, where it's more clearly set out. So why are they held? Well, as I've said already, the, the the key thing seems to be about constitutional change and things linked with devolution and things linked with Europe, things uh, opportunities to change the electoral system, which um, wasn't taken. And it would give those kind of constitutional, cha constitutional changes a kind of level of legitimacy, something above a simple act of parliament. And that can be seen as being important in UK politics because we haven't got that codified constitution in America and therefore the rigmarole and, and legitimacy brought about by an amendment procedure. So it makes a, bit, a, a degree of sense. Now, it can be uh, part, motivated by party issues, particularly if um, parties are split over an issue. And the big issue on this is Europe, because um, Labour arguably called a referendum in 75 because they were deeply divided over Europe and the Conservatives uh, called a, a referendum on leaving the EU in 2016 because they were deeply divided over it and therefore they couldn't make a decision so they decided um, to get the people to. It can be part of a political deal and we saw this with the, the coalition government where the Conservatives said please come and govern with us and the Liberals said yes we will but we want a referendum on uh, changing the electoral system and what came out of that was the uh, 2011 vote on AV. Uh, and it can just be due to general political pressure. So external pressure on the political party. So we see this with the Brexit referendum uh, in, in the UK. So the, the growth of the popularity of UKIP, um, pressure within Parliament from backbenchers, uh, and a, a general feeling that the, um, that is what the people might want. Um, although, of course, Cameron never believed that he was going to lose the referendum when he called it. Referendums have rules. Uh, they are controlled uh, by the Electoral Commission or, or have been since 2000. And the, the uh, Policy, Political Parties Elections Referendums Act of 2000 set out um, 
uh, the, the rules and regulations and, and what the uh, Electoral Commission's job was. So they make recommendations on the wordings of referendums, that these are only advisory, Parliament doesn't have to abide by, the government doesn't have to abide by the recommendations, but generally they do, and again it's not going to look very good if they don't. Um, they register all the groups or individuals who, who expect to spend some money or, on a uh, of more than ten thousand pound on the on on the campaign, either for or against, <laughs> and they they designate the lead organisation uh, uh, organisation on both sides, and that that group then have a higher spending limit. They receive public money, which can be quite controversial, and, and they can uh, they can make TV broadcasts etc. to try and push their side of the argument, and in, and all in the name really of um, educating the population about the issue on which they are voting. Uh, the Electoral Commission then completes a report on the campaign and the spending. Now, there has been huge controversy around the, the Brexit referendum uh, in terms of um, both the spending um, on, on both sides and, and the alleged lying um, in the campaign and most notably on the side of a bus. Uh, and so we, we've we seen lots of mudslinging and we've seen some court cases about all of this as well, actually, where we, we have seen... Uh, a failed attempt, for example, to take Boris Johnson, uh, 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 to hold him to task for um, allegedly lying over the amount of money that would be saved. Uh, and we have had various investigations into the, the, the two sides and what they spent and how they spent it and whether it was legitimate or not. And there is some feeling that the, the rules on what can be said and done and spent in referendums is not as tightly regulated or as well regulated as what we see with uh, general elections and therefore there is some questioning about whether the referendum rules are actually need tightening or uh, or firming up a bit particularly if it's going to be used for such important decisions and it's going to be used relatively frequently the referendum since 97 then so in we've had the 97 election uh, referendum in scotland um which which actually interestingly asked two questions and this is a, a point i come back to when we look at some of the later ones about maybe some of the other referendums might really have benefited from two questions as well. So Scotland, should there be a Scottish Parliament and uh, should it have a tax varying powers? Uh, the answer to which uh, the Scottish people both said yes, the turnout were, was um, just over 60%. Um, the, should there be a Scottish Parliament was, was overwhelming, 74%. Um, the tax varying powers was, was very strongly positive as well at 63.5%. Also in the same year, in 97, uh, Welsh were asked a similar question. Um, they only asked the first part, should there be a Welsh Assembly? Um, they were overwhelmingly not particularly bothered. Um, it, 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 I mean, uh, that's probably unfair. There was there was passionate, passionate argument on both sides, but the turnout was only just over 50%. And, oh... It was close. I mean, it was mighty, mighty close. So we've got 50.3% playing 49.7%. Uh, and so it was yes, uh, and the Welsh Assembly was created. That's since gained uh, more powers and, and um, it had a change of name. It's now the Welsh Parliament. But it, it started off fairly weak because there was well, not a huge amount of legitimacy about that. And there is, uh, and I had, there were calls at the time that maybe we needed an extra layer, so so a straight win maybe isn't good enough when it's coming to something as big a change as that. So noticeably, in, in um, America, if you want to amend the Constitution, you need two thirds majority in both houses, and you need three quarters of the states to ratify. So it is essentially about a quarter of the population voting for something really enough to bring about a substantial constitutional change. A year later, in 98, we have um, in Northern Ireland uh, the referendum on support for the Good Friday Agreement. Turnout was, was brilliant at 81% and the answer was overwhelmingly yes, 71% to 29. <clears throat> we then see kind of a fairly major gap. In 2011, um, we see sh the question, should we the Welsh Assembly have primary legislative powers? Again, we, we now see a, a far more positive response, so 63.5% saying yes, so that one passes. But again, if we look at the turnout, we again start to get the feeling um, <coughs> of maybe a lack of enthusiasm um, for devolution in Wales, with, with uh, not much more than a third of the population who are eligible to vote turning out and voting. Now we get on to um, some really, really big ones in, 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 as we move through. So in 2011, 
we um, we have uh, should the alternative vote replace first past the post for elections in the House of Commons? To which the answer was overwhelmingly no, 68 percent to 32 percent. And the turnout wasn't very good, um, which kind of suggests that the, the British population weren't particularly interested in, in the idea of um, changing the electoral system. I mean, so some of those in favour of electoral reforms argued, well, part of the problem here is we needed like a Scottish style one from from 97, where there was two levels of question. Question one, do you want to remove first past the post? And then question two could then be, um, how do you want to do it? But uh, uh, on the rules of this referendum, that one fails uh, quite categorically. In Scotland in 2014, we had the very bitterly fought Scottish independence um, debate. So should Scotland become an independent country? It was relatively close. Uh, it, it was a no. And we, we say we've, we've had a, a, a shift where all the previous ones seem to have been yes. And we had no to the alternative vote. And when we get no to Scottish independence. But look at that turnout. And this was the, um, the Scot in Scotland, 16 and 17 year olds were given the vote. This was a, a debate that massively engaged the nation and really kind of put pie to some of the, the other arguments about a kind of apathy and people not being interested in politics, because this was a number the like of which we hadn't really seen in, in recent times for a, a vote in the UK. There might well be an addition that's needed to, to this um, video at some point in the not too distant future. There might be Indy Ref 2 uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in Scottish parliamentary elections coming up and whether we get that and whether uh, the Boris Johnson government will allow it. There were some really bitter divides in Scotland over this, and and that could cause that that did cause some issues. But also, again, we go to this bit about is, is that is the question clear cut? If it sounds clear cut, but it, I mean, what would an independent Scotland look like? What would the relationship be? And and a lot of the reasons why people said that they voted no was because they, that uncertainty about exactly what the referendum would lead to. And then uh, the biggie, the one that, that um, has had a, a huge uh, impact on UK politics over, well, ever since the, the idea was um, pushed forward in 2015. Um, should the UK remain a member of the EU or leave the EU? And it was 52% leave. So it's close, but it, it, it it's I mean, it's not not Welsh Assembly close. It, 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 it still passes and the, the turnout is, is very good at 72%. It then did leave a whole heap of a big mess because how is the big question and the how is very complicated and still, as I speak now, hasn't been completely sorted out as we've had a withdrawal agreement and it's gone through Parliament. But then we've had the internal trade bill, uh, which is also uh, going through Parliament, which seems to break the withdrawal deal. And we haven't seen the um, passing of a, a trade deal yet. And so things have got really, really messy uh, with this. And part of the calls have been for a second referendum on this, which then asks, how are you willing to leave the EU? Do you want to leave with a soft Brexit, a Canada style deal, a Norway style deal, a, a no deal? Um, so that bit, and the, we, so we, we get an instruction from the people and then we've had huge problems with getting this through Parliament and lots of arguments in Parliament and it comes into that clash between the sovereignty of Parliament uh, and the, the will through a referendum. And this has caused a lot of anger against politicians actually and then we've had court cases, mass protests and all kinds of things over this issue. So the idea a referendum will give a clear cut answer is not necessarily true. There have also been a whole series of local referendums and um, some really notable ones at the top um, in, in 1998. The Greater, Greater London voted to have an elected mayor uh, and an elected assembly. Um, in 2004, the North East rejected uh, having a regional assembly, uh, which would have been uh, similar to, to the Welsh one. Uh, there have been over 50 further referendums over directly elected mayors in some places have said yes and some places uh, haven't. So, we, for example, uh, you've got Andy Burnham in Manchester, uh, who's a, a good example of, of a, a local mayor. And again, it, it can can raise, um, it kind of gives a figure for that, that area. It's, it's, and again, Andy Burnham has had lots to say over the COVID-19 crisis and in relevance uh, to the Manchester area in the northwest. 
In Edinburgh and Manchester, there were local referendums on whether they wanted to introduce congestion charges, and um, they were uh, rejected about three quarters uh, in both cases. And there's been referendums held over council tax increases and over plans for housing development in, in local areas as well. So <coughs> referendums, we get the really big ones that, that affects one of, one of the nations of the UK or the UK as a whole. And we also have uh, local ones or regional ones as well. So what's the impact um, of this been? Well, there has been some significant changes to the UK constitution. So devolution has been hugely significant and it's probably never been more evident as it has been over uh, the last year or so, particularly with what's been going on with the COVID crisis and when we're getting different decisions in Wales and different decisions in Scotland compared to uh, the decisions in England. And that has really brought into kind of stark focus uh, the, uh, the differences in between uh, the nations and the fact that Parliament doesn't hold complete control on all the elements of what happens in those devolved nations. A lot of those powers rest with the Scottish and Welsh parliaments. Um, there is a real conflict between direct democracy and representative democracy, and this was really strongly highlighted uh, with the Brexit crisis because there was an instruction from the people in the referendum, but the question possibly hadn't hadn't asked enough or there needed to be a follow-up question or whatever it was so we ended up with parliament scrapping over over what brexit exactly meant and um they didn't agree and we went through then a change of conservative leadership and then we went through the 2017 election and then we went on to the 2019 election and still then things seemed to be clear for a short period of time and then we got um, the internal tax bill and things seemed a lot less clear all over again. So it's hard to say this. I mean, theoretically, as I said earlier, they, they could just ignore it um, because referendums aren't binding. But it, it, the proper constitutional mechanism for referendums isn't quite there. And sometimes, though, they, they seem like they're presenting very simple questions. The questions are often in politics a lot more complicated than they first appear, and therefore maybe we need a more honest setting out of exactly what would happen in case A or case B before referendums are run. They definitely seem to have engaged people in politics. There's been massive engagement with the Brexit issue across the UK. There's been massive um, engagement with the idea of Scottish independence in Scotland. So at their best, we get really high voter turnout, huge amounts of media coverage, huge media storms around them. We get lots and lots of political uh, engagement. Um, at their worst, this then turns into really bitter divisions and divisions over stuff that really hadn't been raised before. So that arguably that there weren't huge numbers of people falling out and arguing about our membership of the EU before we had the referendum. And the referendum did things like uh, split families and destroy friendships and just cause really, really bitter uh, arguments in, in British politics. So they arguably they can be quite divisive. <coughs> The education and the engagement is the real plus side, but it doesn't happen on all of them. So again, if we look at the AV electoral reform one, well, there wasn't a huge amount of engagement and there wasn't a, a, a huge amount of um, education that came out of it. I'm not sure this then led to a, a widespread understanding of our electoral system and, and of AV, which um, the system they proposed was actually quite complicated. So what's the case? for having more referendums. Well, the will of the people uh, kind of is, is, is there and it, it removes the doubt that a general election might lead to on exactly what people want um, on a single issue. So on something like Brexit, well, I mean, in, 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 who did you vote for in 2015 if you wanted Brexit? Well, probably you voted UKIP and then UKIP didn't really have any chance of getting into power. And so the, the Labour were, didn't have a particularly united front on it and the Conservatives definitely didn't have a united front on it. So it, it and people might have wanted Brexit but wanted to support Labour or they might have not wanted Brexit but wanted to support the Conservatives. So it, it it's more complicated for a general election. So on a single issue then it, it probably gives a greater clarity. 
Now, there is an argument we have, it's what we talk, talk about, this elective dictatorship it, with, with our government after a general election. And and referendums is a good way of reducing the power of the commons and, and in particular the government and making them more accountable and saying, on this issue, this is what the people want. It shows, uh, arguably, a re support for whether a change should happen or not. And, and that will... That will mean that all those changes are that do pass are, are likely to stay in place. They have public support and, and therefore institutions created will last. Um, decisions will be stuck by uh, and we, it, it would take out the ability for governments to flip flop on things and change their minds because you've got an absolute message from the people. This is what we want to happen. It definitely seems to increase political awareness and, and there's been a lot more political debate, particularly, as I said, surrounding the Brexit referendum and the independence referendum in Scotland. And it can raise all, awareness of all kinds of different political issues, because as they get debated in, in relation to the referendum, then that can open up uh, wider debates on it. So, for example, uh, things like the UK's uh, nuclear deterrent, and that became quite a focus of what was going on with the Scottish independence debate. And that brings that kind of argument um, forward. Um, they are independently um, supervised, as we saw earlier, with the um, the Electoral Commission, and therefore they should be fair. It, it shouldn't just be the case now in the in the UK that a government can have a referendum and put a spin on the question and a, a spin on the way it's run to make sure they get the result that they want. So we should get fair results. The case against referendums, and well, it clashes with parliamentary sovereignty. So it's it's that bit well. If we've got parliamentary sovereignty and we believe in parliamentary sovereignty and we are a representative democracy, if you start throwing direct bits of democracy in, it clashes and it causes chaos. So if you on this side of the fence, you might look at what happened with Brexit and go, look, it's caused bedlam, doesn't work. So if Parliament's ultimately going to make the decisions on how things happen, then they need to make the power to make the decision. So otherwise, we're, we're, we're giving conflicting messages often. And then a bit I've reflected on quite a lot through the video, actually, is, is that the questions are often far more complicated than than the, the way the referendum is posed. So the consequences are not always fully explained. And actually, sometimes the consequences aren't fully known. Um, so <clears throat> will Brexit be good or bad for the country? Well, I, I think maybe be the, uh, the absolute honest answer to that from politicians would be we don't know. Uh, though both sides obviously claimed uh, one way or the other. And several arguably would be far better if there were a series of questions uh, rather than a single one off. And there seems to be this obsession, particularly in the British media and, and among, amongst a lot of people in the debate, that they, this was all, uh, and we get this kind of once in a generation decision and one, one time only. Well, if you want to use referendums effectively, like they do in, in places like Switzerland, well, actually, you don't do it like that. Um, it's, you, you keep going back and going with the people, well, what is it you want? Right, we're doing that, right. On this now, what are we doing now? And and therefore, then it works. But you are becoming more uh, a, a country that's based on direct democracy. So, for example, on the electoral system, as I said, you could go, well, do you like the current system? Yes or no. And then people come back and go, no. Right. OK. So do you want to do this or this uh, or this and, and, uh, and options on that in terms of what happens next on Brexit? Do you want to leave the EU? Yes. OK, do you want this kind of deal or do you want that kind of deal? And then then we we could take it from there. And so you can argue it, it doesn't quite work because it's not the questions have been oversimplified. There's also a lack of consistency. So, um, for example, the Lisbon Treaty 2007, there, there was no <coughs> this brought in some constitutional change. But the, the government, the Labour government at the time didn't have a referendum on it. Um, the so what are the hard and fast rules so again and, until it's built into some kind of con constitution or some kind of exact procedure it, it, it's unclear it can be influenced by party politics or protest votes again there's, there's arguments about this on, on the the av uh, uh, proposal got um defeated because people were angry at the liberal democrats at the time um a lot of people uh, voted uh, to leave the EU because they were angry at the government and successions of governments who they felt were ignoring them. And so they protested, they, they voted as a form of protest, though that is a, a slightly controversial view and not one shared by everybody. 
turnout can be very, very low. Uh, and so, again, we saw one uh, in terms of um, primary legislation in Wales, where we had 35% uh, of the population voting. Again, is that enough? They can be highly divisive. Um, and I mean, that's the flip side, I think, of political engagement and political education often is that not everybody's going to be happy with what happens. But again, it's how damaging you think those political divides are. So thank you very much uh, for watching. I hope that's uh, been helpful and giving you some ideas on, on referendums and what they are and how we use them and the case for and against using more of them. And again, this should help you with your studies, but also I think it's, it's a really interesting thing uh, to think about, especially as referendums have been so high on the political agenda over recent years. If you have any thoughts, then please uh, leave them for me in the comments section. If it's been helpful and you've enjoyed it, please hit the like. If you are interested in more, more videos on politics and on history, then please subscribe. Get notifications as they're added. For example, on A-level politics, I am aiming this year to get through the entire A-level spec and put videos on all of it. And I'm making some pretty good progress. I think this is video 101 of the A-level politics scheme. So if you want to hear more about that and you want more of those, then make sure you subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.